The year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we used to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain on my mind. However, as a memory that will not go away no matter how I try to forget it. 1999 marked the year I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately, the early loss of my childhood innocence. That one memory that refuses to be wiped, it all started with that new, or old, TV. At the time, Pokemon was the latest fad to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers, and the most popular, the TV show. So, of course, every time I came home from school, I would stay glued to the TV until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30, and Pokemon episodes were back to back, which meant I had to miss an episode every day, something I whined on and on about. My dad got tired of hearing me complain every day. That must be why he went and bought another TV. My dad put the TV he bought into my room. Unfortunately, it was just an old, small boob tube, with rabbit ears even. It also only had 20 channels available, not including the channel Pokemon was on. I recall I didn't care though. I was just thrilled I had my own TV in my room. After surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that only Channel 2, TVO Kids, was worth watching, so I watched that for a while. It wasn't for another few months until I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was flipping through the channels, trying to see if Pokemon was on. I pressed channel 21 into the remote, hoping there were more channels, and to my delight, there was. My dad was surprised too, but he let me watch it because it seemed to have been a kids program on. The channel was called Caledon Local 21, and later I found it was indeed broadcasted from my town of Caledon, Ontario, a town very close to my city. The shows I saw on Caledon tw Local 20 looked poorly made, and I never understood what was going on in them half the time. However, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realized more and more how messed up the shows were, and I had to ask myself, what the fuck was I watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember seeing on Caledon Local 21. How I remember such details even disturbed me. But I guess few things like this stand out in your mind for a while. The channel only ran a few hours and shows, probably because it was only operational between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. April 1999. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 12. Very sketchy name if you were to look at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume who would always get a new visitor into his cellar every day. It was always a kid. The show was filmed with a camcorder, and not a very good one either. The police asked me a lot of questions about this show. The episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at a table playing checkers by himself. He sat there playing for a bit until there was a knock at the door. The camera was then looking up the stairs at the door, where there was another knock. Mr. Bear climbed the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age and the other was a girl who looked about eight. Mr. Bear danced in delight, and then started talking to the kids. They couldn't hear any of them that well, I remember. Mr. Bear then led the kids onto the cellar, which was quite dark, only lit by a small oil lamp on the table. I can't really remember that much more, except him singing a song which I couldn't hear too well either, probably because of that large bear mask. The episode ended with them playing hide-and-seek, with the kids hiding in a closet and Mr. Bear counting. May 1999. Soup and Spoon. I don't even think this was a show. I think it was more of a special movie thing. All I know is I stopped watching Caledon Local 21 for a while because I thought this show was too stupid. Especially since Pokemon Now came on at 4.30 and 5. I don't remember much of this, but it showed a can of soup and a spoon both attached to strings, swinging back and forth, as if someone was holding them and dangling them in front of the camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement, which looked like just the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I can't remember much. The only thing I can remember clearly was the end. 
the entire thing was only half an hour and just included stuff I found stupid, such as the spoon chasing the soup around trying to eat him. The ending showed a table and about seven kids sitting around it. Each was a bowl of soup in front of them. They were sitting and looking at the camera, but with confused, almost frightened faces. The cameraman then held the can of soup in front of the kids and said, Spoons ready! And then it just stopped. July 1999. It was summer, and I hadn't watched Channel 21 for a while, until one day when I slept over at my friend's house, and I decided to check it out again. My friend had gotten a TV in his room for his sixth birthday, so we stayed up very late, for us, 9.30 was very late, and watched TV. That's when I remembered Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on, and to our surprise, it was. They must have changed the broadcasting time. Mr. Bear's Cellar, episode 23. The episode was entertaining for my friend and me, mainly because it had swearing. However, now when I think of that episode, I realize something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side while it was facing Mr. Bear, who was walking upstairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for about a second before fading in upright and facing Mr. Bear. There was also another kid talking to him, but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while. I couldn't hear well. Again, it was the crappy camcorder, until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying how it was late and his sister had to go home. You could also hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, Get the fuck out! You're not invited! With the deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looked at each other and laughing at the mention of the forbidden F-word, but the episode got weirder. The kid began climbing the stairs before turning around and saying how he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking into a run towards the kid, who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel then turned to static shortly after. August 1999 I didn't want to watch Channel 21 after that. In August, I grew more curious to see Mr. Bear's cellar for some reason, though. The last episode I saw of Mr. Bear was weird and had swearing, which also made me think the show was meant for teenagers. Nonetheless, I flipped onto Channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear's cellar, episode 28. Apparently, this episode had been playing the entire month of August. It was studied by a lot of the police. The entire episode was just Mr. Bear sitting into a chair talking to the audience. Hello, kids! Do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, please write me a letter at this address. The screen then switched to a white screen with a multicolored letters reading the address, and that was what remained for the rest of the episode. This repeated for five hours every day until September came. And guess what I actually did? I sent Mr. Bear, or that sick bastard who portrayed him, a letter. I did it out of curiosity, mostly. My dad was okay with it because he thought it was a legit kid's show. But then again, he never saw any of what was on the Channel 21. So I wrote the letter using my best writing possible. I think I just said how I wanted to meet Mr. Bear. So my dad sent the letter to the address Mr. Bear sent on the show. It stayed all on day anyway for some reason. It took about a week to get a response, which I was surprised I did. I still have the letter I received on August 15th, 1999. The letter read, Dear Elliot, Thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at, the police cut out the address, Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I cannot believe my dad never found this sketchy because he actually took me to the house. Then that's... And then that's when the police became involved. Those endless questions, those pictures of terrified kids, the woods. That brings me to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some fucked up shit back then. 
and now it seems he's trying to get into contact with me again. The entire police thing is coming back that has brought 1999 back to me. Over a decade later, it is happening again. Update, November 14th, 2009. People have been emailing me exactly what happened in 1999, and I will get to that. Those weird TV shows I was watching apparently were meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. What Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. My dad actually drove me to Caledon along with the address Mr. Bear left on the letter. The house was actually in the outskirts of the town, in the open farmland. I still remember that house. It it looked like an older farmhouse that looked to have been built in the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up, and the house looked in a state of disrepair. As we walked up to the house, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again and looking at the house in disbelief. Then the door opened. I expected Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see a police officer emerge from the creaking doorway. The officer began talking to my dad, while I quickly asked if that was Mr. Bear's house. The officer's face cringed slightly, and he muttered, Oh God, or something like that. He started talking quietly to my dad, so I couldn't hear, although my dad told me to go to the car anyway. And then we just went home. My dad was quiet the whole way home. I felt something strange had happened. My dad never told me what happened for a while. I forgot about it anyway, too. Channel 21 no longer came on, and when I asked about it, my dad would not acknowledge its existence. I think it was about when I was 13 where I learned the truth. I remembered Channel 21 one day, and I asked my dad about it. I guess he finally decided I should hear the truth. Caledon Local 21 was a local TV channel that ran from October 1997 to August 1999 in the Peel region of Ontario. The entire channel was made from a house in Caledon, the house I visited, and run by a man who was not really known by anyone in the town. The channel was only available to older TVs because the signal was one only picked up by the rabbit ears, weaker frequency. The man created all the shows on the channel, all of which were kid shows. He was Mr. Bear, and he was the mysterious cameraman. The real reason he created the channel was more disturbing than what was originally thought. As you might have already guessed, he kidnapped kids and held them in his cellar. But while most people thought he was a serial child molester, he really wanted to use kids for another purpose. The day had arrived. The man had fled his house the night before. The day before the police went in for the investigation, I wasn't the only one who was watching. Update, December 2nd, 2009. Sorry for not answering any questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for some time. Anyway, let me finally set things straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited the house previously owned by the man who ran to Khaled in Local 21. Two women lived there, operating a daycare business. How ironic. Now, to answer the questions you guys have emailed me. Who else watched Caledon Local 21? I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found a few people on the Neoseeker forums who were discussing shows from the Caledon Local 21. They talked about two shows I had watched, but also another two shows I had never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all of the shows that were broadcasted on Channel 21. Here are the two I've never heard of. The Fallen Angel and Life I Am Real Life described it as a fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of the camera about how he must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. Paint with the Soul I Am Real Life and another user called Sigai92 were discussing this show. They described it as Blair Witch-like, as it consisted of the cameraman wandering around the forest at night, doing nothing particularly interesting. I'll go looking for the conversation and see if I can get the link. Question: Where is Mr. Bear with the guy who wore the costume? If I did know, I would have said earlier. I have no idea where this guy is, or if he's dead or alive. Hopefully dead. 
when I see my dad's friend next time, I will ask him about this. Maybe I can get a more definite answer. Question. What did Mr. Bear do to the children? This is by far the most common question I've been asked. I found this out in October as well, via my dad's friend, who is a retired Kaladin regional officer. Apparently, the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the forest nearby. What he did there, police are not exactly sure how it happened, but 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 and 13 were found in 15 by 15 foot ditch deeps within the forest. My dad's friend did not want to go into the exact details, but I'm seeing him next Thursday anyways, so maybe I can extort more information about him from then. That's all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog. I will try and gather as much information as I can for my next post. I've actually been getting pretty interested in this myself. It should be my right to know what the hell happened. Update. January 14th, 2010. I'm sorry I haven't posted anything for a while, I kind of lost interest in this blog since I had to stand still while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Kaladin Local 21. However, a few weeks ago, I struck gold. I found some answers surprisingly from the father of a kid I used to babysit. He lives just across from my street, and I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job, either. He used to live in near the woods outside of Kaladin, and witness the owner's activities in the woods. His name is Anthony Polo. When he lived in the small bungalow outside the woods, he would often venture in to smoke a joint of marijuana or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Polo described that sometimes he would hear voices of children coming from deeper within the woods, as well as a glowing light on the distance. Polo told me these events started in late 1997, Note, this is around the time Coward and Local 21 begin airing. He apparently became more annoyed by this happening every once in a while, and actually went to investigate. Polo then described what the whole scene looked like when we got there. There was a group of kids, he said about 13 to 17, in ages 5 to 12, gathered into a large fire pit with a burning fire. With them was a single adult. Polo talked to the man. Nothing his unusual unkempt appearance of a crack addict, as well as his constant twitching, and asked what he was doing out in the forest with children. The man said they were on a camping trip, something they did frequently. Polo, not suspecting anything, Caledon has one of the lowest crime rates in Canada, simply left it at that and told them to be quieter. Polo then paused for a while before telling me that they were never became quieter. In fact, sometimes he heard loud chanting from the children in an unknown language. He didn't bother meeting with the man again, as he was moving, anyway. I told Polo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it, as he heard that the man was moving to Pickering by several other residents in that area. Here's what I know now. The man would have take kids into the woods regularly for camping, the fire pit Polo described may be the hole the bodies of the children were found in. The children Polo saw are probably the ones found dead. The man moved to a city called Pickering, a smaller city east of Toronto. I will discuss with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything the police know about the man. I also want to see if he has any other knowledge of what was aired on Cowed in Local 21. Update, February 10th, 2010. Good news, guys. I talked to my dad's friend, and he disclosed a lot of information for me. First, I asked if the police have any information on the man who ran Cowed in Local 21. He replied that he only had the lead, the same leads for years, and never found a suspect. However, the Peel Regional Police do have some of the tapes found in the house Cowed in Local 21 was broadcasted from. He took me over so I could watch a few. I guess I hadn't said much about him yet. My dad's friend is named Mitchell Wilson. Pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge of what happened during the late 90s in that house. He feels it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me so much. He took him to the Davis Road Police Station. If you don't know, it's the largest station in Caledon, and one of the largest within the Peel region itself. Even with the main stations around Peel have some of the tapes. I was able to watch all of the footage when the Davis Road station has. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any of the tapes home for obvious reasons. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10. Garbage Thrown Away. Paint with the Soul was one of the shows that I Am Real Life and Signy 92 discussed on Neoseeker. I told the police about this and they informed me that 12 episodes of the show were made and broadcasted between December 5th, 1997 and January 8th, 1998. Exactly as I Am Real Life and Signy 92 described, the episode opened with the cameraman wandering around in a forest. It appeared to be during the evening as it was seen the sun was setting. The cameraman walked along a path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage lying in the leaves. The camera looked around at the various wrappers, bottles, bags, and boxes, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. The camera then focused on a single area before the man spoke. I recall he spoke in a very timid, quiet voice, and I swear I've heard it somewhere else before, like on another Cal on Local 21 show. I could barely hear what he was saying, but he was mainly talking about how humans are garbage, or something that had to do with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage. Us. It actually sounded really stupid, but still a feeling of dread came over me. I mean, that forest was possibly where the bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 25. When the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, Oh shit! and chuckled a bit out loud. Of course, I had gotten stares from the sheriff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear and how I still kept the letter he sent me. Like the previous episodes, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. The episode began with Mr. Bear waddling over to his cellar door with a bottle of orange juice in his paws. On the ground were 16 shot glasses as well as a small bottle that contained an unknown liquid. Mr. Bear poured an equal amount of orange juice into each glass before opening the smaller bottle and depositing one drop into the glasses. Mr. Bear then went off camera. There were some minor sounds such as shuffling and then Mr. Bear emerged from behind the camera's location. Following him were 16 children. Some looked as young as four, while others looked that they could be practically teenagers. As the children entered, the administrator commented this is the only episode that showed all 16 victims. The kids all looked rather content, except for this one who had visible bruises on his face, and unlike the other kids, he had a more fearful expression. He also looked about 11 or 12, which caused me to recognize him. He was the kid who asked about his sister, and subsequently an unknown fate at the end of episode 23 the one episode I had watched during July 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed that it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, an episode that only aired once at 3 a.m. in July 1999. The police have still yet not found the tape. Mr. Brer then broke into song, singing about citrus fruit and how good vitamin C was for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by the bear mask. The kids all drank their juice, the one from episode 23 doing it rather reluctantly, and then the episode ended. After viewing the tapes in possession of the Davis Road Police Station, I'm satisfied, but only temporarily. I still want to know the full story. The police just kept giving me the same crap about the creator of Cowden Local 21 being a fetishist pedophile as well as an apparent cultist. I will sign off for now, get into university first, and get information later. Hopefully, I will get back to this blog as soon as possible. Update. May 8th, 2010. Last month, I finally got my G2 license. In Ontario, Canada, this allows you to drive in a car by yourself, as well as some passengers after six months. I, of course, took advantage of this and drove into Caledon for a little Sunday drive. Since I haven't updated this blog in a while, I figured I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than when I last saw it in October. The place was no longer used as a daycare, and just sat there, abandoned. However, it did have a for sale sign showing that someone still owned it, wanting to get rid of it though. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, mainly of that day my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. A feeling of dread came upon me. What happened to the children while they were living at the house? 
I walked up the steps to the front door and peered through the window. Inside, I could see a nearly empty hallway with a few boxes at the end. At the end of the hallway to the right was an open doorway, presumably leading to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, both apparently leading to the rooms visible through the windows outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located and whether it had been sealed up. I walked around the house to the back and found my answer. Two wooden doors lying at an almost flat angle were padlocked shut. This had to lead to the cellar. Not wanting to hang around, you cannot imagine what was going through my mind at the time, I departed. Behind the house, the empty field continued on until it released a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if that was the forest where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, fuck it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was oddly quiet, save for the few periodic sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. I cautiously made my way deeper into the woods, not really caring about the fact that I had no idea where I was going. I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something I had to find. I came to the thinner part of the woods and a few small houses in the distance. Polo's house crossed my mind, and I wondered if one of these homes had belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized logs gathered around a black, charred area, showing a small fire that had been lit there recently. Hey! Get the fuck out of my fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. I turned to my left and saw two dark-clothed people running towards me. My initial thought was to run, however, as they came closer, I saw that they were really just kids in their early teens. Possibly 13 or 14, maybe even 12. As they approached me, they realized my size as well. I'm 6'1", while they could have been no bigger than 5'8", one might have been 5'7". We said, get the fuck out! The larger one, who was wearing a Slipknot shirt, said that half-heartedly. I stood my ground and shrugged. The shorter one, who was wearing a Metallica shirt, swung out a butterfly knife and held it in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to, I said in a deep, serious tone, trying to sound as badass as possible. I pulled out my cell phone. The two kids withdrew, the one in the Metallica shirt putting away the knife. Look, dude, we don't like people in our fort, so can you just go? The one in the Slipknot shirt said, obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyway, so I uttered out a simple, fine, and turned before I realized I had a great opportunity. Did either of you hear about a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about 13 years ago? I asked the kids. The two looked at each other in confusion before the one wearing the Metallica shirt answered. Yeah, everybody knows about that guy, he said to me as if I were stupid. The kid in the Slipknot shirt continued. He still lives around here, in the storm drain. My big brother's friend says he saw him in a bear costume once, wandering around the forest at night. My instincts told me this was possibly a lie, and the owner of Caledon Local 21 is probably long gone, only existing as folklore in the similar isolated community. However, as a human, the thought of the mysterious unknown sparks interest within. And where is the storm drain? I asked. Just out of curiosity, I don't actually believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments, his eyes seemingly full of annoyance, yet curiosity for me. You're not from around here, are you? Why did you even come here? Now, I do admit I was slightly startled by the nature of his question. However, I figured I might as well explain why I was there, just in case people mistook my intentions. I told the two kids about my experience with the man of the Callan and Local 21, and that I had to come and maybe seek out some sort of closure, although even I wasn't exactly sure. The kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description how to get this to the storm drain. Shortly after, I decided to just turn around the way I came and head back to the house, leaving the kids there for it. But now you're probably wondering why I left out such a detail about where the kids told me just now. It is because I'm choosing to conclude what I have gathered now. Here's what the kids told me in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kids' fort, the same direction I was heading. The drain ends at a small river, where access water is drained out. 
Near here is a small playground. The kids told me people rarely use it. The man supposedly lives here in the large pipes that rainwater drains out of. Most people have seen him, although always either wearing a bear mask or the mask in a fully body bear costume. Note, I do not believe this is true, but in fact simply a myth created by the residents of Caledon. The story does not seem plausible in any way. Why did no one call the police? Didn't this guy look suspicious? And other questions like these leave the story invalid. I may visit the storm drain. Not because I believe this story, but because I want an excuse to visit Kaladin again. So this blog doesn't die. With no more tapes to watch, I don't even know what to talk about anymore. Thank you for continuing to support me in the blog. I know many are looking forward to more information about what happened in Kaladin during the year 1999, and I will do my best to continue my research into the topic. Hell you out. Updates. October 7th, 2010. Wow, nearly five months since I last updated. I'm guessing everyone pretty much thinks I was dead, right? Thankfully, I'm not. But in all, my, in all seriousness, I really have been busy the past few months. And to blog about something that could have killed me as a kid was a little low on my current priorities list. As of now, I am living in Waterloo, Ontario, attending as University of Waterloo for computer engineering. Yeah, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park, so obviously I nearly forget about this blog. But as you can see now, I am back. I remembered to visit the storm drain the kids from the Caledon Forest told me about. It was out in a clearing behind the wooded areas, nearby a marsh. Unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing, save for a turtle that retreated into its built-in home when it saw me. I snapped some pics of the pipe which I have posted as well. Also, let me tell you it was not a storm drain, like they said it was. What I saw was a simple pipe, possibly to channel from access water to the marsh. When I returned from Caledon, however, I simply kept putting off uploading everything until I forgot all about my blog. It just didn't seem important anymore, please forgive me. It wasn't until only recently that I am interested in my case again. On September 10th, I received an email from this email address, returnthebee bee at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? Well, it gets better. I'm going to copy and paste the exact email this guy sent me. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy. You see, the story may or may not be true, but it could have happened. There are many slots for airtime. If you have the money, you have a public access TV channel. Some public access channels share airtime, like EWTN, religious space channel out of Michigan, that shows Catholic-based programming, but during off-air hours have independent shows or just blue screens. Cable networks have empty channels available for rent space, so the scenario of a pedo renting a channel on basic TV is not far-fetched at all. However, public access TV is widely reviewed and can be terminated at any time. These are the rules for the United States, not for Canada, where the story took place. So, if this happened in the US, the pedo would be tracked and arrested imed immediately. Yes, the story could happen, but it is unlikely. 100 Fuzzy Hugs, Mr. Bear. Now, obviously this letter is fake, and it sounds almost corrupted. But still, I would like to thank whoever sent it. Though, they could use some English lessons. Just reading this letter creeped me out, but because of it, I am now full of this new interest to continue my blog. I guess it's funny trying to pursue the mysteries I've always questioned. Now my roommate knows all about this. He thought the letter was real and actually seemed more scared than I was for a second. But then I shrugged it off, so he did too. I mean, what are the chances of this being real? How would Mr. Bear know all about this public access TV? And about when I haunted Kaladin on those occasions? More or less know my email, or me still being interested in the seller. Ha. Huh. I'm going to send a reply to return the bee. Wow, just looking at the email address, you can tell someone wanted to freak me out. It didn't really work, though. Although, to whomever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter, because I can find out more about what happened to Mr. Bear. Hopefully, because although I don't buy that email, a part of me still feels anxious. Thank you to all of those who are still continuing to follow me and have become avid fans. 
You are also why I am choosing to continue to follow this. Thanks, guys. Update. November 7th, 2010. Wow, I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't posted anything for so long. I have my reasons, and I'd rather not discuss them just yet. It has been a rather traumatic year for me. Some of you were right. I shouldn't have gone back to trying to relive the mysteries of my childhood, but I couldn't resist. It was over a year since my last post, and a lot has happened. Let's recap where I'm at right now with regards to the whole Mr. Bear incident. Return the bee at Hotmail.com is no longer in use. I tried replying to the email, but I got no reply. I tried again a while back, still no response. I've actually moved up to Ottawa, capital of Canada for those who don't know, for universities, so I haven't been back to Caledon or back to home in Peel region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving, as you can guess why. I've had to make a new email account because people keep prank calling me to pretending me to be Mr. Bear. Thanks a lot, guys. Why have I ventured back on this blog? Mitchell Wilson, remember my dad's ex-cop friend, gave me a bunch of phone calls on October 23rd about a tape that was found in a branch of the Brampton Public Library. Brampton is my hometown, in case you haven't picked up on that. He claims that it isn't allowed to discuss the contents of the tape with me as it is still evidence, but he asked me to come check it out when I return home. The tape got the gears grinding again because we all know what was going on the last tapes I saw. I could only imagine what could be on it. I'm guessing it must have been something to do with the coward in Local 21. I guess I just wanted to say I'm continuing this blog and thank you for everyone who still follows it. I don't know when my next entry will be, but when I see the tape, I'll write what I find. I don't know what to expect, but this idea of seeing another tape has gotten me interested in this whole mystery all over again. Elliot. Update. January 21st, 2011. It has been a long year for me. University has been giving me the usual sleepless nights because I transferred to Ottawa, which is THE place to study. Sarcasm. But now I'm back home with my dad in Brampton, the town I grew up in. I got home on the 18th of December and would have been visiting my friends and family, or at least that's what I would have rather than done. Now that festive holiday cheer that I usually have around this time of the month is absent. To answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend, Mitchell Wilson, promised to show me. These tapes, however, act as a curse. I wanted to know more, yet I want to forget everything. I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes. Not only for myself, but for all you guys who are just as intrigued as I am that I felt an ominous mare in a bear suit from my past. However, after viewing those tapes, I feel that pit of dread deep inside me once again. That feeling where I know that all of those kids in those videos are dead. That I could have been one of those kids, and that humanity is a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped this paragraph for the juicier details below, thank you for listening to my rambling. On January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was a time where I can come by and view the tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm, so he said I could come up for down any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me. So, I braved the slushy roads and terrible Brampton drivers and made my way to the Peel Regional Police Station, located at the Bermala City Center. I met Wilson at the front desk, where he then led me up to the second floor and into a small office. He instructed me to have a seat and wait while he got the tapes. Before leaving the office, he turned to me and said, I know you're curious, but are you sure you want to do this? Of course I did, or at least I thought so. Besides, Wilson's friend had pulled a lot of strings to get me in there, and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. This particular station had two tapes on hand. I was only able to watch a few minutes of footage, however, because the second tape was apparently too damaged to be played on a VCR. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 30 Mr. Bear never ceases to disturb me, especially after what almost happened when I was younger. The episode took place outside of a forest at dusk, making it slightly hard to see anything considering the quality of the film, a trademark of anything from Coward on Local 21. The episode started with the camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear aiming it at himself. That 
bear mask. It looked more sinister in the shadows of the trees. The unmistakable muffled voice spoke up. Hello, children. Today I will be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. I will be delivering them to a faraway land where they will surely be happy. Mr. Bear turned the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer, but what stood out with most was the trailer contained seven motionless children inside, side by side. Th this is here is the first load, but more will be here on their way soon. Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera at a large burlap tarp spread on the ground. He picked up the tarp, revealing a large hole that must have been at least 12 feet deep and maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of Mr. Bear talking to each kid and dropping them into a hole. I asked Wilson if they were dead, to which he shook his head and replied, Not yet. Soon all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions due to being tossed in, but they remained unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on a great journey that awaits them, Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera towards the multiple bottles of gasoline besides Bush. The camera zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that these were seven of the sixteen victims found burnt to a crisp. The gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of burning children? Who the fuck would do that? That feeling of dread found me once again when I realized that I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he had previously lied. The other tape confiscated by the Bramala police branch did indeed work and contained the filming of the actual burning. However, he felt that I wouldn't be able to handle the disturbing and graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe I can't. I don't even want to see it. I'm satisfied for now, but I just need some more time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran local Kaladin 21 is still out there. More to come soon, Elliot. I-N-R-I Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Elliot. Elliot was a clever boy who loved playing with his friends. One day, he watched a lovely television show about a bear and his childhood friends. The children loved helping each other as good children should, but they also loved the bear. The bear loved the children since the children were so good at helping him and the fallen angel. The children and the bear wanted to play together forever with the help of their angel friend. But the fallen angel needed even more help, so the children had to give the ultimate sacrifice. Because that's what friends do, Elliot. They help each other. Help us, Elliot. Burn with us. Elliot, I want you, Elliot, he wants you, Elliot, come back to my cellar, pretty please with sugar and icing on top, Mr. B, INRI, update, April 5th, 2011, I, I wanted to update more, I truly did, however, certain circumstances have turned me off to the whole cow and Local 21 thing, I've since then, I've had hundreds of emails about my blog, and that was even in contact with a magazine about my story. But now is the time to come clean to everyone. Where have I been for an entire year? The story of Pandora's box is true, and I opened it. I opened it when I watched the second tape in possession of the Bramala police branch. The other subject I'd like to address is the number of joke fake emails I've been getting from people claiming to be Mr. Bear. Let's Start with the second tape, as that is what traumatized me into stopping my search temporarily. After a few weeks of playing silent, I decided to ask Mitchell Wilson if I could view the infamous second tape he had talked about. I don't know why, I, I just felt like viewing the tape would give me some closure. Wilson was obviously reluctant to show me, but I was persistent. He gave me an offer. If I was still interested by the time I turned 20, he would show me the tape. Not being able to do much else, I just played the waiting game. By the time my 20th birthday rolled around, I was definitely still interested in viewing the tape. I gave Wilson a call, during which he admitted that he had hoped that I would forget about him asking again, but I was not taking no for an answer. You really don't need to see it, he kept telling me. But I did need to see it. I had to at this point. 
Sure enough, invited me to the Bramala branch one Monday afternoon. Having watched every Saw film in a video of animal slaughterhouses in my ethics class, I was sure I was able to handle whatever the tape could throw at me. How naive I was. Mr. Bear Cellar, episode 31. When Wilson went to collect the tape from the evidence, the officer in charge of the evidence room shook his head at me, his face saying, What are you doing? Wilson explained this tape includes the last known episode of Mr. Bear's Cellar. I rightfully assumed that I would be seeing the fate of the children and began to feel a sense of dread. The episode opened inside of a forest, the usual one from my previous episodes. The fact took me a, this fact took me a while to realize because it was night. The trees and leaves had shaped and looked like shapes dancing around in darkness. A faint glow of light was present on the right side of the screen. There wasn't any apparent audio. It appeared to be a windy night, yet the trees weren't making any noise. Slowly, the camera began to pan towards the glow, revealing smoke rising from a hole and the tips of flames peeking out over the top. Wilson paused at this point. Are you sure you want to see this? He asked me. I insisted on it, even though a voice in my head was telling me not to. The video continued. The cameraman moved towards the hole, showing a pit of fire. This was the hole that I had seen in the previous episode. Only this time, it was filled with shapes. I could see shapes moving around, fluttering, flailing, some motionless. I knew perfectly well what they were. The camera began to adjust the light and burning flesh. Red, black, and a blur of surreal movements of colors. I wish I could forget what I saw, but you can't forget a scene like this. This was not a horror movie, this was reality. Human beings were being killed in a horrifying way, a fate that I could have potentially met. The video was suddenly cut to dawn, the camera now positioned farther away from the hole. The fire was out. However, there was still smoke rising up. A figure was up ahead. I recognized it right away. The Mr. Bear suit was laid on the ground. Empty. It looked just as unnerving. The suit was laid out in the shape of a cross. The cameraman did a lap around the suit, treating it like a treasured artifact. Placed at the head of the suit was a sign. In bold letters, INRI was printed. The cameraman moved back to the suit. Zooming in on the bear's face, the episode finally ended. I was speechless. It was like a dream. You can find a lot of terrible things on the internet, but I had never seen anything like this. Wilson asked if I was okay, and I replied with a shaky yes. I assured him as we left that I was fine, and the video gave me some closure over the whole incident. He didn't seem too confident in me, but he left it at that. He was right, though. I had nightmares for weeks. I gave up. I didn't care about the whole thing anymore. A sick band burned a bunch of kids alive, attracting them to a fake kids' TV channel. I could have been one of his victims. Yet I'm still here. I suppose I should be grateful, but I feel guilty. Am I still here only by pure luck? Ten months later, now that I'm back, but now I need to address something else. My email has been flooded with messages. Some people ask for more details, some ask if I can upload the tapes, and some people email me claiming me to be Mr. Bear. Firstly, I cannot get the tapes uploaded as they're A, in police possession as evidence, and B, I have no idea how to transfer VHS into a computer. As for the people pretending to be Mr. Bear, you're not fooling me. When you have dozens of people pretending to be the same person, it doesn't work. I've even seen a fake Cowden Local 21 YouTube channel, which is cute, but still not real. Even more annoying is the fact that someone hacked my account just to put up some demented poem about me on this blog. I'll leave it in the entry above this one, just to show you guys. I have contacted my webmaster about the entry and was told that it was posted on Halloween. Oh, spooky. Attached to the email paint with b at aol.com, which I assume is another joke email. I'm over episode 31 now. The images of what I saw will stick with me for a while, but I want to do one last hurrah. I will get in contact with Mitchell Wilson again and hopefully get set up with the tapes in possession of the other Peel Police branches. I'll try and update you guys as soon as I can. 
I'm not sure this will take so long again. Thank you to anyone who still reads this. Elliot. Now that was the famous or infamous story, 1999, by I believe Camden Lamont is the author. Now, what can I really say that hasn't been said before? This is one of the, like the quintessential creepypasta. This is one that people would recommend that their friends read in like 2014 when the genre really blew up. But I do have some things to say about it. Also, apologies for the sniffling. I'm still a bit under the weather, but... Firstly, it's written from an epistolary like a uh, point of view, as in it's like the writings of the character through a blog. I feel this does well to kind of root us in the center of the main character Elliot's experiences. You can kind of see how much more attention to details in certain posts towards the be the end when he's more interested versus the beginning when he's more just doing a point by point documentation. But I do feel there's this is kind of a drawback, mainly because something about the pacing of the story is all over the place. It's like, the last post is him talking about how horrifying, like, the burning of the bodies Mr. Bear is doing for his Satan ritual, but he's complaining about fake emails just as much, which, you know, it's valid that people would pretend to be the guy and harass him, but something interesting is that the creepypasta page was vandalized a couple times. People just added stuff, and Camden was really mad. He, he like, kind of seethed over it, so he just, he, uh, wrote that as, like, a, hey, knock it the hell off and quit, like, distributing edited versions of my stories, which, I mean, if you're gonna edit the story, maybe give it an ending next time, because what was that? Like, I know what they were going for, is like, oh, I'll update you one last time as a little cliffhanger, then just ends. There's like barely an implication that, what, like Mr. Bear got him or he died or he took his own life or something. It's just not there. Like that was so weakly implied that I, I was literally scrolling down the wiki like, huh, where, uh, where's the rest of the story? And it's not there. So I will say the ending sucked. That was really miserable. But the story does have a lot going for it. Firstly, very, very creepy scenario of, uh, like, being a little kid watching a show, almost being abducted for a weird uh, satanic ritual. And I find it interesting that they specifically go out of your way to kind of tease you with like, oh, he's just a pedophile. Not really. They just, they give it, throw you a curveball, which I think is interesting because it'd be very easy to just say he was a child molester and like, I'd be fine if he was written to be that way. But a lot of people feel really strongly about that subject and would rather have it not written online in general, which people have their own opinions about, but... It's interesting that it happened, you know, it's like there's, there was thought that went into the creation. But one thing I'll say is that the more we find out about Mr. Bear, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's like he's crazy, likes kids, but he's like wants to sacrifice him for the devil. And that's it. Like, most of the horror was just the build-up of, like, gradually viewing more tapes, talking to police, investigating homes. It's, like, true detective. Then the actual, like, meat and potatoes of the spook is not very spooky. Like, this would be scary. Like, it feels like an Irva Leving book, like Rosemary's Baby and the Dawn of the Internet. Like, for the time, it was probably scary, but it's not really doing anything for me. Like, maybe I'm just desensitized to it, but I feel like you could have been a lot crazier than just... But, uh, like, a bunch of kids died and got burned, because if you are a resident of Ontario, and especially in Ottawa and Brampton, that happens more often than you think, because Brampton is, like, one of the most insane cities in the country. It's horrible, and that kind of stuff just sort of happens. It's like a horror, like you said, a horror story in Chicago, and like the main threat is four people died in a shootout. Like, yeah, that happens. It's not that like it's terrible, but most of the city is kind of stigmatized. Like they don't really care. They're desensitized, and you sort of see that with uh, the kids. He goes around the Caledon area, who's kind of just turning the guy into a folk legend because he just kind of was around and he might have moved, and no one really did that much about it. 
because I, I got the implication the police are being kind of lazy with it. It's like, oh, yeah, you killed a guy, whatever, we'll deal with it. And they're not really looking forward to it, doing kind of a half-assed, like, in investigation, kind of just humoring Elliot, which I think is pretty realistic. That's, that's basically what happens with Canadian police, from my own experiences, but... It's still a good story, and I think it was adapted on, what was it, like, Channel Zero, I think, for Amazon. I never saw that. I, what I did see from, like, trailers looked kind of lame, because I never liked Candle Cove that much, which is a very similar story. Like, this thing, it checks a lot of boxes, 1999, of, like, being a prelude to lost media, and the way it describes the TV shows, I wouldn't say cliche, but it has a lot of conventions, like, then the camera went black, and then something scary happened. But it's just like a guy recording it in a camcorder, somehow broadcasting it through like public access, because Canada's apparently had a big like loophole of that. Which is like that it would make more sense if he tried to. I know it's like coming from the perspective of his childhood memory, mind you. So it's obviously he's going to be a bit of an unreliable narrator. But I felt it was kind of flaccid that he just like it went black. Then it showed up again. They didn't describe him kind of weirdly, meticulously fiddling with the camera, being a one-man show, because he was the only guy doing this stuff. But th those are my thoughts on it. I liked the story. I think it definitely deserves its spot as a classic to be respected. I felt like uh, it could have had either some of the fat trimmed if it wanted to solely focus on Elliot like it was going to, or if you wanted more of a cast of characters to run along with, it should have been expanded, because it just feels a bit lopsided. Like, some things were given a lot more emphasis, and then some things don't even connect. Like, we hear so much about this kid's engineering career, and then how he gets his driver's license. It just does nothing. He, like, does the stress get at him? Is he failing classes? How stressed could he possibly be if he's still, like, doing well as an engineer in Canada? It's, like, notoriously tough, but... I feel like the more critically you look at the story, like, if this was sold in a book and was written, like, traditionally epistolary, there'd be a lot more issues. But as, like, a free-to-read internet story, it works pretty good. I certainly have a lot of, uh, a lot of praise for Camden, because this is, like, a super big story. Everyone knows 1999. It's quintessential. But I also think it could be, it could definitely be improved upon. And it kind of... I would definitely love to see like a story like this with a bit more focus on character drama, like a true detective with a little hint of the supernatural stuff, which is kind of what happened in season one, the only good season, which is funny. But more than anything else, I want to know what you guys thought, because it's just such a classic story. And this is the longest creepypasta I've ever read. My voice is shot. So let me know what you guys think.